Well, um, good, morning. good morning. How are you? Good, good. I, you know, when I saw all of you coming, I said, wow, my name gets around. And then she said, oh, you get a certificate. So, aha. Uh -huh. So I'm not the draw. OK, I got it, got it. Well, I am delighted to be able to share with you uh, my journey through inequality. I pull no punches. And so buckle your seats. Uh, and let's go for this wonderful ride through my journey. OK, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Aha. So introducing myself, you've already had an introduction. Um, I advise healthcare executives nationwide. And uh, I'm also a social activist, uh, especially against any form of injustice. And so, as you can imagine, in today's environment, I stay pretty busy. <laughs> and so I'm going to walk you through the affirmative action to diversity and inclusion uh, continuum. I'm going to share some firsthand experiences of things that have happened during my journey, talk about the barriers to workplace equality, and then especially focus on the fact that leadership matters. And then I will talk about my commitment and advocacy for equality. And it's very important for me. In, in today's environment, it's especially important. I happen to have two sons and six grandsons. So every day I'm checking on them. Are you OK? You know, don't put your hood on. Don't do whatever. And because uh, Lord knows, the world has not seen the vengeance. Anyway, that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole nother topic. OK, so affirmative action. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've had speakers before, and, and they've told you the definitions of these things. And, and in the USA, the, the, firm, the affirmative action uh, really kind of, and I'm going to show you a continuum in a moment, in the 70s. And it was really to create a moral obligation to hire the disenfranchised. And at that time, it was mostly uh, referring to minorities, uh, sexual orientation, and uh, disabilities, and so forth. And so it was really to kind of correct some of the, the previous uh, practices of racial or discriminatory hiring and firing. So that was a legal aspect. So it was a, a moral obligation uh, with some sanctions if you didn't necessarily comply. Diversity. Diversity came a little bit later on the scene. And it's kind of interesting. By the way, I was born in 1948. So I'm 70 for all of you who were wondering, well, how old is she? And I'm sure you weren't <laughs> even wondering that. But I've been through it all. So when I talk, and, and, and I'm going to say this, um, in one of my law school classes, and by the way, I will go back and forth, um, one of the professors was saying that during the period of Jim Crow and so forth, if you were black and you went to a restaurant, you could do takeout and show that, you know, that was no problem. And I'm like, excuse me? Takeout? I was born in Georgia. That might have meant a greasy hamburger somebody throws at you. So don't call it takeout. It wasn't Burger King, all of those things. So anyway, I'll go back and forth on that. So that was kind of that era. Diversity was supposed to bring in inclusion. Uh, in fact, inclusion wasn't talked about as much. But it was more, you know, it's saying, OK, we're going to bring in, when we talk about affirmative action, people get, to get offended because they just think it's talking about minorities and women. So when we say diversity, we mean everyone. Everyone's included in that. And, it, and so it encompassed economic, education, generational differences, and so forth. So it was to embrace all of the differences, value, and accept those differences that people 
bring into the workforce. That's what it was supposed to do. Inclusion then comes on a little bit later, and it's really we want to communicate value to everyone. It's diversity's counterpart, diversity and inclusion. And inclusion means that we value the contributions of everybody in our work environment. The plaque on the wall says people are our greatest asset, and we mean that when we say inclusion. And I, as a leader in a major corporation and actually started the diversity, was the first director of global diversity for Raytheon in 1998. And as this progression continued, one of the things that we introduced was respect. Because you can have diversity, you can have inclusion, but you're going to have diversity because it's natural. Diversity is not new. I mean, from the beginning of man and woman, you had diversity and everything else. So anyway, um, we introduced the concept of respect based on a survey from our uh, employees when they, we, they were asked, what was most important to you as far as leadership embracing who you are and what you bring into the workplace? And so they said, respect. So we launched a campaign on respect. So let's look at this continuum, and I may refer to my notes here a second. So first of all, you had the push factors. And the push factors are those that say, you know, not only is it a moral obligation, but if you don't do it, there are some consequences. So Roosevelt, in 1941, introduced an executive act to end federal employment discrimination and discrimination in the armed forces. And a lot of people will say, you know, that was so great of, of Roosevelt. He, it was just so wonderful. And it, and it was. However, there's a pull factor on that one, too. Because of war, and there weren't enough white men to fight in those wars. So they needed some brothers to come in and join the action. Roosevelt was also told by A. Philip Randolph. Does anybody know who A. Philip Randolph is? He was one of the leading labor activists of African Americans way back when. And he had also threatened Roosevelt that if you don't do something, he actually was uh, leading the sleeping car porters. He said, I'll bring 100,000 black people to Washington and we'll march if you don't do something. I guess Roosevelt thought about that and said, 100,000 black folks, I better pass something. So he passed that act. And so that was 1941. So then in the 1960s, the civil rights movement began. And the civil rights movement was really about how do we bring about, how do we end segregation and discrimination, and it was primarily at that time a black movement. I mean, the Martin Luther Kings, the Jesse Jacksons, John Lewis, and others who were fighting for equality for black people, a fight that unfortunately has never ended. And then we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and dear Lyndon Johnson, and the Civil Rights Act was really, it was legal recognition of citizenship rights for minorities. Legal recognition. And in fact, during that period of time, the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee was uh, enacted. And so there were some teeth, if you will, given to the Civil Rights uh, Act. And then in the 70s, I just talked about it, you had affirmative action. And that said, you would hire qualified individuals. Qualified was in the word. Well, why would you 
hire anyone that was unqualified was always a question I had because people would ask, are you qualified? Well, so anyway, that's, we talked about affirmative action. So then we move her over into the pull factors and Workforce 2000, I remember when that report, have you all had any exposure to the Workforce, okay, 2000, um, this was a report put out by the Hudson Institute. And it really was kind of like the momentum behind bringing diversity into the workplace. Because basically, the Hudson Institute said several things. One, they were changing, the US was changing from a manufacturing to more of a service industry. And be, it also said because of birth rates and things like that, people of color and women were going to be more predominant in the workforce, so you better start recognizing them and developing them and so forth. And it also said that people were going to get older, the aging Americans. And so as a result of that, you had this institutional knowledge that would be exiting the workforce. So they were saying to employers, you better get ready. If you're gonna be able to compete and if you're gonna be successful, you better start looking at people of color and women to fill those future positions so that you could have a market advantage. And then you had then the diversity and inclusion movement that began. And again, the momentum behind it was the Hudson Institute's report. I talked about the respect, and then I added this one about Google and Apple in their diversity reports. Because for years, they had been trying to get Silicon Valley, Oracle, Yahoo, Google, Apple, to, hey, why don't you share your diversity statistics? And it wasn't until 2014 that Google and Apple decided to share theirs. And I just recently read Google's 2017 report. And basically, uh, people of color, especially blacks and Hispanics, are still excluded from their workforce. Women have made major gains at Google. I think they've gone from like 17% or something to 34%. However, people of color, especially males, are still excluded except for Asian Americans. Questions, or do we save them for afterwards? Okay, I'm any, no questions, I'm gonna move on. So let me share a little bit about you, about my journey through these periods of time that I've spoken about on the continuum. So I doubt if there's anyone, is there anyone in this room, and most of you won't, that remembered Steinfeld's department store? Yeah, I knew you guys were kind of young. So Steinfeld's used to be one of the most elite uh, department stores in downtown Tucson, and this was when Tucson, I mean, downtown was a place to be, and at Christmas time, Steinfeld's was beautiful. Well, lo and behold, Daisy goes to the employment office because Steinfeld's was hiring, and I was 18, and I'm like, oh, I'll get a job there. So I go to the employment office, and now remember, we're talking a little bit before affirmative action, because we're talking in the late 60s now. So I go into the employment office and I sit down and talk to the lady and she calls the personnel manager at Steinfeld's and I'm sitting there and says, I have this lovely Negro girl here. Her hair is nice. She speaks well. She's dressed nicely and she's interested in a job. I mean, you know, like, whew, okay, I need the job, young military wife, so what the heck. 
So I go to Steinfels and I walk in and the personnel manager, that's who she was at that time, I remember her name very clearly, but I won't say it in case she has any relatives here. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so she says, oh my God, you do look nice. And you know, I'm, as we talk, I'm so impressed with how well you speak. Okay, yeah, I learned that pretty early, probably around two. <laughs> and she says, you know what? We have the perfect job for you. And she says, I mean, with glee, you will make the perfect elevator girl. And I wasn't as poised and professional as I am today after years of grooming. <laughs> so I threw some tears in my eyes, said you can take your elevator and shove it up your ass. <laughs> oh, is that okay to have it on the camera? Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> and so, and I, I literally almost ran out of her office. And however, when I got home, my husband said, there's a lady called from Steinfeld's department store and said, you're hired as their sales girl. And I was their first black sales girl at Steinfeld's. Soul stuff, those little old men were buying all those little bikini underwear and stuff. <laughs> it was so cool. The next big moment was Mountain Bell Telephone Company in Tucson. They needed a test case. Anybody remember Mountain Bell? I know I'm really aging myself. And careful about raising your hand because I'll age you too. And so, and so anyway, I was a test case for the NAACP. And so I went and I took the test for a service representative because they had never had a black service representative. So I was told, we're so sorry, you failed the test. So I go back you know, to the NAACP and let them know. And then they also had the African American Coalition. This was in Tucson now. And so they said, well, they got a subpoena something. They had to surface my test and show it to them. Of course, I had gotten 97 out of 100. So then they said, well, we can't hire her because her Negro accent will offend our customers. So they were forced to hire me anyway, with the Negro accent. And you used to be able, they had charms that they would give for people who sold the most phones. Well, let me tell you, me and that Negro accent, I had charms <laughs> everywhere. I was giving away charms. <laughs> but understand that when I walked into the cafeteria, People would walk out. And those are things that were very painful. But can you imagine if I could sell charms and, I mean, phones and all of that when people were treating me poorly? What do you think I could have done if somebody was treating me with respect? Honolulu, Hawaii. And this was, I worked at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. I'm like, hey, I'm in Hawaii. They like black folks here. I'm good. <laughs> so my first day, no, it might have been the first week, it was pouring rain, torrential rain. Oh, it was raining so hard. And uh, someone, one of the women came up to me and said, Daisy, today is your day. And I'm like, it was around lunchtime. Today is my day for what? <laughs> you have to go and get the guy's lunch. I'm like, excuse me? Yes, we get the guy's lunches. And I'm like, but it's pouring rain out there. They said, well, you know. And I said, well, do the guys go get our lunch? And they said, no, they don't have to. And I well, hell will freeze over before I go get their lunch. <laughs> so they reported me. I was uh, deemed insubordinate, but I challenged them 
and said, you know, I don't mind going and get the guy's lunch if they go get my lunch. If they won't get my lunch, I'm not going. So guess what? I won. And the women no longer had to get the guy's lunch. Well, the guys didn't like me for a little while, but they got over it. And I mean, it was, it was like, this is not supposed to be happening in America. It's not supposed to be happening, but it did. And the second photo you see of me is I joined the EEOC committee so that, hey, I could continue the fight so that women would not have to go get lunches or any other demeaning task. <sighs> Affirmative action, Hughes Aircraft Company. Armed with a master's degree, I was hired at the lowest level clerk. Couldn't get any lower. However, one of the things that I committed, I said, I'm getting my foot in the door, and in five years, I'll be in management. I bring this particular period on the journey of my journey because there were some wonderful people who helped me along the way. They didn't look like me. We weren't the same gender. They were considered some of the toughest guys in the organization. I learned a lot of bad habits from them, but they were great. They were my mentors. They were my sponsors. But I can tell you, I don't know how many times I was passed over for a position by a male, typically a white male, who was less qualified. And remember this thing about qualified. So there was some career stagnation. So I proposed that Hughes Aircraft Company send me to law school. And they go, you gotta be kidding. We only send engineers to school. Why would we send you to law school? And so I wrote this white paper about how important it was and that especially if I'm going to be a future leader in human resources or whatever, think about the value it would bring to the company if I'm a lawyer and I can help you avoid so many problems. They said, no. So I got to thinking, I think I had this legal gene. And I said, you know, there had at least been a couple of situations where I was passed over by somebody that was definitely not as qualified as me. And I would hate to, you know, try to take any kind of action or anything like that. <laughs> so they said, okay, we'll give you a full sabbatical to law school. <laughs> so, Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Uh, Malcolm X says, by any means necessary. So, hey, now I went back. I loved the company. I went back. Of course, they put handcuffs on me, so I had to go back. But it, it really, I'm still using this to say that when your career progression is stymied and when you feel like there's nothing else left but to try to take some action or to fight for what is rightfully yours. So now it's diversity. 1998, I was Raytheon's first director of global diversity. And I was handed a tablet when I asked, well, what have you done in the past in diversity? And there were four sheets in it. So it was like, you build it. And so for me, at first, you know, people said, you're not going to get any support. I mean, nobody really cares about diversity. It's just in name only. But you know, I said, doggone it, this is an opportunity to mobilize and to really help get this company on the right track in looking at people who are different 
and looking at people with value of what they can contribute instead of their secondary, their physical features or the color of their skin or their gender or sexual orientation, whatever it is. So I built this diversity wheel and I think they still have it. But the chairman of the board of Raytheon was very offended that sexual orientation was on the diversity wheel. And they said, she either takes that off or you get rid of her. And I said, I'm not taking anything off. You can fire me. Now, Lord, I was praying, please do <laughs> not, do not let them fire me. But I, you know, I called them on it. I said, I'm not taking it off. I'm not taking any of these off. Nothing. So finally, I guess good sense prevailed and it stayed on the diversity wheel. But it was invisible. I was the invisible woman in an environment that had hardly any women and there were certainly no people of color. I would be at the table and no one recognized me at the table. No one asked me questions. When I raised my hand, I was invisible because no one wanted to hear what I had to say. It was very interesting because the person who was eventually, and I didn't know, heir apparent, to be the CEO of the company. I happened to visit him in California and I said, you know what, can we just get rid of all rank and you are not this Mr. President, blah, 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 and I'm Daisy and you, we're just the two people. Can we talk? And I shared with him how it made me feel when he and others ignored me at the table. How it made me feel when you excluded people who were very capable of performing at higher levels because they were not white males, and in many cases, white females, but mostly white males. And it was very interesting because this guy became one of the first champions of diversity. And he attributed to that session. So one of the things that taught me about being in a leadership role when you have to help make a difference is that it requires courage. Now this guy could have fired me too, but he didn't. And we became very close and he said, this mentoring helped me um, become a better leader. And that's why leadership for you in this room really matters when you are creating a workplace or a work environment or a work culture where people feel valued. I advise CEOs the C-suite and I will have someone say to me, you know, Daisy, I, I strongly believe in diversity and I, I, I believe that women, we should have more women in the leadership roles. And so I pull out his org chart and say, you may believe it, but I don't see it. And it has helped because sometimes leaders need to be called on like the Googles, the Apples, the Yahoos, and, and I could just keep naming, you can talk the talk, but where is the walk? So let's talk a little bit about the barriers to workplace equality. I talked about the lack of leadership commitment already. And then there's this social con conditioning this conscious or explicit bias, where people know they don't like people for whatever reason. I don't like you because we're not the same religion. 
I think all Muslims are terrorists. I think black men are thugs. I think, and it goes on and on. And as a result of that, I treat people the way I feel that conscious bias that I carry around with me. And then there's the unconscious bias. And by the way, we all have these. It's where I believe, my beliefs and, and my attitude toward people, I don't necessarily recognize it, but when certain people come around me, I get scared and I treat them differently. Uh, I, I'm not sure what it is. I wasn't taught that way and I have, don't have a prejudice bone in me, but it's something about them that terrifies me. And then, of course, there's that institutional and systemic phobias and bias. I, um, in high school in California, even though I graduated as one of the valedictorians and everything, my counselor said I was not college material. But you know what, Daisy, you could be, and trust me, I'm not in any way making disparaging marks about, remarks about these particular fields, but you could be a good nurse's aide, and, and you could be a secretary, you could even aspire to be a secretary, but you can't go to college, because you're not college material. And then we have these culturally biased tests. I'll give you an example. So the test says, they will give you a place setting. And there's a plate, there's a knife, there's a fork, a napkin. And they ask you, well, what's missing? Well, you know, I come from humble beginnings and with a plate and a fork. Well, guess what? When it said nothing, I, nothing was missing because everything that I was used to was at the table. So why would that determine how I would get into college? It's, it's just, anyway. And then there are these unwritten rules in the work environment. And anyone who's worked in corporate America, <laughs> I'm nodding at a dear friend over here who we worked together for a while. And they have so much prevalence in how things go in the work environment. They're not those plaques on the wall that say we value everybody. It's what people in leadership especially come into the workplace and some of those unwritten rules that they enforce that deny opportunity to people who they see as different. So I'm going to give you an example. So in 2007, I was Tucson's Woman of the Year. Kind of neat. And there were two men. One was the Man of the Year, and the other was the Founder. So this is an example. I said unconscious bias. Some people say, well, it seemed pretty conscious to me. But anyway, so one of the things that they do is that they send a uh, limousine to pick up these esteemed award winners. And so my family had flown in and everything, and I said, oh yeah, you know, the limo's coming soon. So in my circular driveway, this limo comes in. I, I, does it look like it's what, 19, what, 67 or something? I don't know. And I'm like, and my sister is like, oh, is, is that the limo? <laughs> now remember, this is 2007. So we get in the limo. I'm a little embarrassed. So we get to La Paloma. The men of the year come. Look at what they're in. 2007 sleek black limos, and here I am in this buggy. <laughs> How do you think that made me feel? That's unconscious bias. It says, 
it's okay. I mean, she'll be fine if we send her this deadbeat limo. I was going to say something else, but I've, I know I'm on camera. <laughs> Conscious bias. Pay equity for women in particular. It is known that women make less for doing the same work. And it was something that as a leader, I really pushed hard and fought against. But I want, this is... 2,000, what are we, 18 black women, on average, 63 cents to the white male dollar. What do you think it is in, and by the way, women, on average, it's 80 cents. What do you think it is in Louisiana? Guess. Lower, 47 cents. What about DC? 52 cents. They ran this test on, on 25 states. Unfortunately, Arizona wasn't one of them. And so, but again, this is conscious bias. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Where does Starbucks fit? Yes. Is that conscious or unconscious? Conscious. Yeah. I, um, I've seen people when someone comes on the airplane of Muslim descent. And I've seen people, you know, if you're on the Southwest flight, it's like you can hear them say, oh, God, don't let them sit here. Conscious or unconscious? Conscious. conscious bias. And some of it is perhaps unconscious, but it, these are the things that impact the lives of people on a daily basis. And it worries me. All of my grandchildren are biracial. And so I don't care that they're biracial. A bullet doesn't make that kind of distinction. And it's a shame. I used to have to worry about my sons and grandsons driving, getting their driver's license. That was like terror, terror for me. But now it doesn't matter whether they're eating, driving, walking, talking, whatever. So that's why I want to talk about leadership and why it matters. Leaders should be intentional as a role model in cultivating a workplace of inclusion. Action speaks louder than words. I tell anybody, talk is so cheap. And if you're a leader in a company, you should be the biggest champion of diversity. You shouldn't just relegate it to human resources and say, you guys take care of it. It's not the way it's supposed to be. I think leaders and individuals who are in a role that affects the lives of other people should take a self-assessment of themselves and say, what am I bringing? What biases am I bringing into the workplace that could impact other individuals? Take personal accountability for diversity and inclusion. And then hold your leadership team accountable. There should be a success indicator for diversity as part of the company strategy. I bet you Starbucks will have one soon after you have to close 8,000 stores for diversity training. <laughs> yeah. Would have been a nice gig for me, but anyway. <laughs> and <laughs> that's okay, my business is doing good. And so, and then the board representation. It's still horrible for women and people of color. 
I think they'll get these presentations, right? Okay, so I won't go through all of these. Um, I say define diversity and inclusion as broader than gender and race or sexual orientation, but it can't be defined by white guys who all went to different colleges. It has to be defined by individuals. And if there's a black leader, it can't be for blacks who went to a different uh, colleges or Asians or whatever. Discrimination takes many forms, and there are still black leaders who are afraid to hire other blacks, even though they're qualified, because they don't want to appear as they're favoring. And be able to demonstrate the courage to stand for what's right in an organization. I think that's so important. I think there are too many chickens out there now, too many wimps, who won't take a stand for what's right because they're afraid of what does it do to my career? Or what does it do for my paycheck? And, and, and I can say, yeah, there probably are some promotions I lost along the way because of taking a stand and being very vocal about rights. But at the same time, there were many things that I gained as a result of being someone who was principled and who fought for the rights of everybody in the workplace, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, whatever, because we miss out on talent. I remember working in healthcare, and they said, well, we shouldn't hire people with tattoos. And I'm like, well, what's that got to do with the kind of care they can provide. Well, people might get offended if they see the tattoos. Well, make them wear long sleeves, whatever. Uh, but it's just some of the things that we come up with are so ignorant and stupid when it comes to how we exclude people. It's so amazing that bias, conscious and unconscious. So let me tell you a little bit about my commitment and then I gotta stop. Okay, so I'm gonna hit on one is that I continuously strive for goodness. And one of my goals is to help change the political landscape that promotes divisiveness, hatred, inequality, and injustice. And it's so rampant in our environment today that we pick on people because of their national origins, or, or we say people are rapists because they came from Mexico. <sighs> it's, I mean, these are things that we just, we can't allow it to continue. So my commitment is that I'm gonna stay on that daggum battlefield, especially to save and revitalize public education, which is under attack, which means that children in poverty will not have the same quality of education as children who can afford to go to private schools. Somebody's got to be there. We got to end the school to prison pipeline where eight-year-olds and seven-year-olds are being arrested. It's insane. And then the fight against mass incarceration of men and women of color. So just not a plug for my books, <laughs> but just thought I'd show you Within the Walls, A Journey Through Sexism and Racism in Corporate America is a novel about the experiences of diverse individuals in the workplace. It's a story. It doesn't give anybody this guilt trip. And The Green Machine is about the mass incarceration of black males. And some of the stories are based on a year-long uh, series of interviews. And I do a lot of writing about issues that affect especially my community. So that's it. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> sure. Oh, OK. So there's a quiz. Yes. Oh, oh, questions? Oh, okay. So, 
First question, an example of implicit bias is when A, B, C, or D. Ah, she told me you guys were kind of smart. All right, okay. I know you got this one. Franklin Roosevelt signed that executive order in 1941 so that, ah, geez. The purpose of affirmative action in the workplace was to? Ooh, ooh. Which one? A is right. Remember that it, C says to eliminate policies that promote equal opportunity. The lack of pay equity for women is an example of, yay. And diversity and inclusion are important initiatives in the workplace because of, yay, give yourselves a hand, wow. A little bit of a hiccup on three, but you recovered. <laughs> Yes, yes, ma'am, in the back, behind you. Had it been somebody else in your position having to go through so many hardships in life, that someone would have broken down, but you did not. So what is it that kept you going? So there are a couple of things. Um, one is that I'm a person of faith, and uh, so I rely on that. I'm also a fighter. And so, you know, I, I did a presentation to about 150 women last night, and I said, for me, no means not over. So when someone tells me no, I will fight like heck <laughs> uh, to make sure that, you know, it's, it's corrected. It hasn't been easy. There are times as an executive, I have literally gone into the parking lot in my, in my car and wept over things that were happening. But I didn't want it to happen inside. Get myself together, go back in and continue fighting. That's what it's about. It's, 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 it's to create change, the right change. Yeah, so that's the motivation. You were next, I'm sorry. So working at the global level, mm -hmm. I don't have to be politically correct or anything, do I? <laughs> well, we have one big problem that I can think of in Washington. Um, <laughs> I mean, it would, it would be nice to have sanity in the White House again, but um, I, I, I think the environment we have now has emboldened racism in our country. I mean, kids are being bullied, and so this nastiness and this meanness. So I, I can't compare it to other countries. I can only say that what I'm seeing here is a major setback, it's a major regression, and I am tired as hell of it, and will continue to fight against it. And I, I mean, I, there are some days I cannot watch CNN, I never watch Fox anyway, but I cannot watch these shows because I get so upset. So, yeah, so I, I, I don't, it's hard to answer. I, I, I'm just disappointed. Uh, he, he was here, sorry. So, just a general question, what made you start your own consulting firm? Was it, did it have anything to do with your fight for diversity? I know it was about money. <laughs> I, it, it was, no, really, it was uh, to the point where I wanted to do my own thing. And I was, I, you know, I have the uh, appeal, and so I, I grabbed it. I want, if I want to work in my pajamas in Tucson, I can do that. Uh, I have great clients, and they pay well, so I, that was a factor. But um, 
it, the other part about that is that even though I'm a no-nonsense with my, ad, you know, my advisees, I call them, these are senior executives, the, one of the things that I tell them when they hire me, or before they hire me, is that if you don't want the truth, you don't want me. If you want a yes person, you go hire someone else. But if you want the truth and you want to move in the right direction, you hire me. And so far, it's, it's worked pretty good. Yeah, so that's, that's why. It, it, I continue the movement, but it's, it's an opportunity to do it on my own terms. OK, and then you. How about your journey in education? What, did you experience anything oh. after school? And how did you stick with it? <laughs> I, do I have time to share one little? So when I was in law school, and um, I had this professor in criminal law. And in criminal law, we didn't have, all the tables were brown, like a mahogany or something. I would always raise my hand. He would never call on me, never. I, I mean, it was weird. So I had one of my white friends, I said, now, Wendy, you raise your hand. So she raised her hand. She was sitting next to me, and he called her. And she said, I'm actually raising my hand for Daisy. <laughs> and so he looks at me, and I'm like, oh, God. And I said, because sometimes you know, I, I need to think a little bit. I said, yeah, because I guess I'm fading into this mahogany uh, tables because you never call on me. Oh my God. Every time he called on me, I had to be prepared. <laughs> but oh, oh my word. He called on me forever. But it, you know, it was one of those things where why are you ignoring me? And it took one of my friends to get your attention that my hand is up. So that was U of A Law School. Behind you, and then I'll come back. Uh, so you've made a sort of a career out of telling people things they don't want to hear and being <laughs> to, uh, to listen. Uh, how do you suggest people talk to people close to home who have evident conscious bias that they express? Uh, and you know, whether it's in the workforce or it's in your own family, how do you, how do you tell the, how do you, how do you, because people get defensive about their, their beliefs. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, there are many divided households in today's environment. And, and it's, it's uh, it, it, to me, it's having a conversation. And, and sometimes it's very hard to have a civil conversation when you're talking to someone that just doesn't get it. And of course, they're saying the same thing about you. Um, it's, it's a tough thing, but. I, I think it's the communication and, and, and respectful communication. I um, do not choose my friends by their color or their, um, their beliefs, although most of them we all agree. But we have these conversations uh, walking up Sabina Canyon. I walk Sabina twice a week. And you know we, we delve into these different issues and sometimes People don't agree with me. And, but I listen to them and um, I respectfully listen. And then I share you know, my thoughts. Sometimes it has an impact and sometimes it doesn't. But I do feel it starts with respectful communication. And sometimes you just can't break through. I mean, there's not going to be that agreement. People have been so conditioned and, and socialized to uh, have these issues. I travel. I'm in a business suit. I'm in a hotel. And I'm walking down the hall. And I have my briefcase in my bag. This couple comes out of their room, sees me walking down the hall, runs back into their room, and locks the door. And I'm like, jeez Louise. Get a grip. So I don't know. I, 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 it starts with communication. Because I do have you know, many friends who don't agree with me and think I'm a fuzzy-headed liberal. But. What? Oh, shucks. OK. Uh, 
this not this might not come across as very popular, but when you in your presentation especially you mentioned that, and I'm glad that you specified that diversity means everybody. It's mm -hmm. not just everybody else apart from the white Caucasian men. Uh, for the sake of my question, when I am talking about diversity, I will refer to everybody apart from white Caucasian men. And my question is, um, you as somebody who is a very strong advocate of diversity, you must have liaison with many other like-minded people as well. So, do you have ever come across an unconscious bias for hiring diverse people? That's just something I was wondering about. I'm sorry. Say again. Uh, have so I come across somebody who is a very strong advocate of diversity? Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt or sensed an unconscious bias, say, towards hiring somebody who's not, you know, your everyday white Caucasian man? So, so my personal unconscious bias. Uh, yeah. So, mine are so weird. <laughs> I, I'm serious. It's so weird. I'm not going to even share it because it's so weird. Because <laughs> you guys are going to, and I'm on tape. Can you cut the tape off? No. I, I, I'm a person that, um, well, I'll give you an example. So, I, in my role, I hired executives. And so now, I didn't care what they looked like, you know, whatever. But I would look at their teeth. <laughs> I told you it was not so. <laughs> and if I didn't think they had good hygiene, okay. does that, is, that's an unconscious bias. Is it conscious or uh, unconscious? <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> I have blown my cover. <laughs> but, I, and, and I mean, seriously, okay. I, I have looked at a resume and, and I saw someone said, uh, and this is another thing when you do your resumes, you be careful about these things, that said, and, and this brought up my bias, he said, his resume said he was a member of the Young Republicans. And I'm like, mm -hmm, I'm not going to hire him. And then I had to catch myself and like, that's not right. He had every right to be a member. And, and he was hired and, and was a great guy, but unconscious bias could have gotten in the way of him getting a job that he was highly qualified for. Would you say the same if he was a member of the Communist or Nazi Party? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, if, he was, if he was a member of the Nazi Party, I like, Security, security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 